Hey everyone, it's Patch 3.22 Ancestor, and I want to talk about Caustic Arrow Death's Oath. Now, this is a build that I played two seasons ago in my first Mage Mode from Scratch series and had an absolutely amazing time with it. This build was a build that just cleared through maps really easily. And you can think of this as a different version of RF. That's probably the best way I could put this for people, where you're effectively playing a walking simulator that is relying on Death's Oath to do most of your clearing. And then you're using Caustic Arrow as a increased single target damage button if you need a little bit of help. This build is just really, really good at speed clearing maps, especially since everything you need for this build is just really cheap and really easy to put together immediately, while also having a really nice set of defenses with some auto curses that will immediately curse everything around you. Viridi's Veil to make you immune to crits, as well as making enemies damage unlucky against you and just a decent amount of life and a decent amount of evasion that make this a pretty well-rounded build. If I haven't sold you on the build enough already, if we want to talk about how good it is at mapping, well, it's a really good legion farmer for very cheap. It's not going to be super strong in tier 16 maps without at least a decent bow, but for about a five div budget, you should be able to clear legions with no problem. It's really good at expedition, especially super early on, because there's no mods that break it other than just immune to chaos damage, which is fine. That's only one remnant. And it can do every other mechanic like it's nothing, especially because it can just immediately fill the whole screen with Caustic Arrow, effectively allowing you to immediately kill anything in half a second without it even really getting a chance to move. If you play this build in a ritual, you'll see that the ritual monsters just don't appear they just die the second they spawn because every single little bit of the ritual area is filled with caustic arrow now what i want to talk about today is the 322 version of this and all the changes that are going to be happening from 321 this is intended to be a full leak start guide all the way from the beginning of the build all the way to the end of the build so all the information you should need to be able to play caustic arrow throughout the whole season will be available here now the first thing to mention is this build hasn't really changed that much there really aren't any big additions that are going to make or break this build. And overall, 3.22 has been a pretty tame patch. Literally, none of the balance changes apply to us at all. So this is going to be exactly the same thing as 3.21 minus the new tattoos. Now, those are going to be the only real interesting things to talk about. Now, the one tattoo that is going to potentially change things is going to be the reservation tattoo. This gives you 1% reservation efficiency of skills in exchange for getting rid of an attribute passive point, which is completely okay because we don't really need that much intelligence in this build. So what we could do is we can just remove one of our intelligence points and instead turn it into reservation efficiency. As you can see here, we are at 7% mana, but that is with the reservation efficiency mastery. If we were to just get rid of this, as you can see, we're ever so slightly off of having enough mana to be able to turn on everything without the need of that mastery and without the need of these two points in general. So if we were to get one of these tattoos and just replace any of these small nodes with it, then simply we just get two points back and actually a decent amount of DPS as we are putting Transcendent Mine in here. And because we picked up this intelligence, we do lose out on a little bit of damage, which should be a very, very nice increase for the build overall. Otherwise, the only other thing that might be interesting here might be the tattoos that give you plus one skill gems. Now, this has not been confirmed, but I'm going to assume because it wouldn't make much sense otherwise, but I'm going to assume that how we have here a turn 30 int node into plus one int gems, I'm going to assume there's going to be a turn 30 dex into plus one dex gems as well. And if that's the case, it's going to be very good for us because we're pathing right by clarity. So we would simply use the plus one dex gems tattoo that we hope is going to exist. We don't know yet because it's not been data mined nor has it been revealed and turn alacrity into plus one dex gems, which should be quite a nice damage increase. Should be about a 10% damage increase or so. Otherwise, the passive tree and the jewels have basically stayed the same. The only other big change for this build going into the next season is going to be the leveling section. Now, the way we have leveled this in the previous seasons has been with Spark. What I recommend to do is to look at the notes for this build. I put a lot of time and effort into all the notes they need to play this. The leveling tree and the leveling path of building is going to be three path of buildings, one for leveling, one for a swap over to Caustic Arrow, and then end game path of building. But the leveling path of building and the Caustic Arrow respec path of buildings have pretty extensive notes in them on how to fully play this build. The Caustic Arrow respec one also has some 
suggestions on what gear to look for, what stats are important, and has even a few crafting guides in it as well. There is a bow crafting guide in here, but there's also a full video on it that I will link in the description below if you want to know how to craft your own perfect best in saw caustic arrow bow. But it's going to give you a basic guide in here as well and a guide for a starter bow. So please, please, please do look at the notes as I put a lot of time and effort to answer basically every single question you have about caustic arrow. Let's talk about leveling and the big change here. So we are going to be using rolling magma instead of spark. Spark got nerfed in Crucible and it was still fine and people did level with it and said they had no problem. But for this season, we have realized that actually leveling with rolling magma is a little bit better than rolling than leveling your spark all the way until we get poison concoction. The big disclaimer I need to give you with this build is poisonous concoction. You will need poisonous concoction. This is basically impossible to level without it. I have had a whole paragraph here that talks about it, but you will need to get it either by making a ranger at the start of the season and muling it yourself and then making a witch and starting to level your witch or to get a friend who's either playing with you or playing alongside you to give you poisonous concoction when they hit level 12. This is going to be really painful and I promise you no other chaos dot skill is anywhere close to being good enough to level this. We have to level this with poison concoction. But as soon as we get it, we'll have a really comfy time and a very easy way all the way until maps. We do not want to play caustic arrow until we get a good bow. It will be really, really painful to play without at least a half decent bow that looks something like this. And until you're able to get this, I really, really recommend to just stay as Poison Concoction. Now, Poison Concoction has been nerfed. That's OK. It'll still be decent enough for early maps. Or if you want to do heists to make a little bit of money before you start your build, that should be enough to get you enough currency to be able to make yourself a decent bow to start the build. If you want to quickly go over the leveling tree here, there are going to be different trees for each different act and on how to pick everything up. At first, the first thing we're going to be doing is just immediately rushing down to wasting and down to replenishing remedies. We kind of need replenishing remedies to be able to play poisonous concoction. And this will basically make sure that we have enough life flash charges to never run out on bosses. So for act one, we're simply just spending the whole time just getting there as fast as we can. This is OK. We don't really need any damage nodes because rolling magma is going to be strong enough to carry us all the way. Then in act two, we are going to pick it up as well as picking up entropy just because it's so much damage. Then in Act 3, we are going to rush over to Fatal Toxins. This is going to give us some Poison Chance. So we will just do substantially more damage. King of Things of Viper and pick up Charisma so we can fend all of our auras. Then in Act 4, we're going to be going and picking up Eldritch Battery. This will take care of all of our mana problems. You do want to make sure you have a few Energy Shield items at this point. Otherwise, Eldritch Battery will not be good. But Eldritch Battery should completely take care of any mana problem you have at all. And you can completely just reserve all of your mana, assuming you have a decent amount of ES through some of the ES items you pick up. Next, we will be picking up the small reservation node as well. And this will give us enough mana to fully reserve everything. This will allow us to run both to 50% auras and Herald of Agony. After we get all that, we're going to be picking up Multi Shot. Now, Multi Shot is going to give us an additional projectile. And the way Poison Concoction works is you shoot out a bunch of flasks that then explode. And those explosions actually lap each other. And because of that, you can get multi hits. So with the initial projectile, while this won't really be good on normal mobs because your hitbox will be too small, it will be good on bosses where the hitbox is really big, allowing you to effectively get 25% more damage against bosses. Then afterwards, we're going to be making our way down to Swift Venoms for Act 5. And then Act 6, we want to make sure we pick it up. This is going to give all of our poison chance. And then we'll also be getting Herbalism while we're here. Then we're going to also be getting Blood Drinker. Blood Drinker is just going to give us life on kill and going to make us really comfy. Now you can pick up the 50 Mastery wherever you want. You can either pick it up down at Herbalism or pick it up at Blood Drinker. It's up to you. Then lastly, for the next few points, we'll get Growth and Decay for some regen and for some damage. We'll pick up Atrophy and we'll be picking up Brandon Blood. And then lastly, as we get close to maps, we'll just be going over to Crow Prep, pick up some Resistances and some Life as there's nothing else really good and Blast Radius for a little bit of generic area damage. Next, we also have a tree in here for Caustic Respect. This is basically going to drop all the poison chance as we have zero use for it. We're going to pick up some more life instead, changing the tree a little bit to have a little bit more efficient pathing and picking up some gems, while also getting Hunter's Gambit to give us a little bit more damage over time with bows. Again, you would not be swapping a Caustic Arrow until you have a decent bow, like the one that is in the Caustic Arrow Respect at the building. To quickly go over our ascendancies for what we level, the first one that you want to pick up is going to be Void Beacon. The second one is going to be Withering Presence. These are just going to be really strong and we don't have any way to realistically curse too much. So Unholy Authority for the additional curse isn't going to really be good while we level. And Profane Bloom is not going to be good until later on once we have a way to fit in a Blasphemy into our build. 
But Withering Presence and Void Beacon are going to be your first two labs and take care of all of your damage problems, as well as make you Chaos Risk Cap, which will make it feel really tanky to play. And then we pick up Unholy Authority and Profane Bloom in our third and fourth laps. To very quickly look at Bandits, we want to just kill all Bandits. We don't need the mana regeneration from Alira, and the other two are completely useless, so we just take the two passive points. As for the gods, I would recommend to go with Lunaris or Solaris based on what you want. Lunaris is going to be better for AoE and for mapping where you have a lot of mobs around you, while Solaris is going to be better for just bosses. I would honestly recommend Lunaris as you're going to mostly be mapping with this build, but Solaris is also not a bad option. For minor gods, you can either go with Aberrant Wrath for some Ignite Duration removal on you, as well as Immunity to Burning Ground, which can be quite annoying. Or you can instead go for Grokthol, which is going to give you physical damage reduction when you get hit, which synergizes really nicely with Lunaris for even more physical damage reduction while you have a bunch of enemies around you because you're most likely going to get hit. Let's talk about the swap over to Caustic Air a little bit. So there's going to be two items that you really, really need. First off, you're going to need a Death Soth. And second of all, you're going to need a good bow. Now, a good bow, as I mentioned, and there is a crafting guide in the notes for it, it's just simply a plus one bow. This is very deterministic and very easy to get and only cost you maybe around 20 to 30 chaos to make. Now, what I recommend is to get a Meriketh bow if you can for the movement speed, but any bow works. Now, you could also just look on trade to see if you can find some sort of plus one damage bow with damage over time multiplier on it and then simply benchcraft chaos damage on it. But you could also just make it yourself. And if you do that, you can then get a, yourself a six link bow through any of the myriad of ways of getting a six link bow, either through the cards or just buying one and then crafting yourself something really nice. The other thing that's going to be important here is Death's Oath. Now, Death's Oath is a really interesting chest plate. You're going to need to make sure you have the 180 strength required for this, but most of the gear on here is kind of empty of anything. For example, if it's this amulet, it literally has nothing on it but sovereignty. So it's pretty easy to fit in any of the attributes you need between your amulet, between belts, between anywhere you have a little bit of space to be able to get any of the attributes they need for the whole build. Now, moving back to Death's Oath, the way this works is it's going to always trigger Death's Aura around you, which is basically like an invisible RF. Any supports that we put inside of it will be automatically linked to it. So you do not need to six link this. You just need a six socket Death's Oath. What you can also do because of that later is look for good and corrupted modifiers on it as you can just take a nice corrupted Death's Oath Use some tainted jewelry orbs on it, which should be really cheap. Make it six socket and then use some tainted chromatic orbs to recolor it, which means you can get yourself a really nice corrupted death soul pretty easily. The stats you care about here are the all attributes because it's going to make getting the rest of your attributes really easy. And then the life roll, if you can get a decent life roll, that would be nice. In terms of dealing with the chaos damage from it, we just want to make sure we have high chaos resistance. A lot of this is going to be taken care of by our ascendancy. But you also want to maybe try and get in some amethyst rings to help you with the rest. In terms of coloring Def Soth and how to get the right colors for it, there is a guide in here as well on how to recolor Def Soth. So I'd make sure you check in that. I was also check this for the gems to figure out which gems you put in where, because the supports that you actually put in your chest plate matter and you only want very, very specific combinations at very, very specific times. So please do check this out. In terms of the rest of the gear, it's pretty simplistic gear. The quiver is just going to be some sort of damage multiplier quiver with maybe a resistance on it. There's quite a lot of good suffix rolls they can get on a quiver, but damage over time multiplier and damage with both skills are the two best ones, as well as a little bit of life. For a helmet, we're going to be trying to get ourselves a mana reservation efficiency helmet as we are really, really tight on mana reservation, simply because we're going to be running so many auras, as well as running a blasphemy with two curses on it. This is a very, very much aura bot like build where we're trying to fit quite a lot of things at once. So for a helmet, we want to get mana reservation efficiency on it with an Eldritch Craft. For the, for the Searing Exarch, you can get anything you want on here. You can look for Curse Effect if you want to make your curse a little bit stronger, or you can look for any of the other rolls that you might like. For gloves, we're going to be using an Asenafs. Now, Asenafs should be really, really cheap at the start of a season, and these will allow you to have really nice clear. Between these and between Death Soth, you should get some really nice chain pops that should pretty much immediately clear everything on screen for you. For boots, we're just looking for a bunch of movement speed, a bunch of life, a bunch of resistances, as well as chance to avoid ailments and some movement speed. You could also look for action speed instead of movement speed. It's up to you. Both are just fine. For amulets, you can get quite literally anything you want on the amulet. What I might recommend, instead of just getting a default amulet, if you're good on attributes, is maybe an eternal struggle. Eternal struggle is a really, really good option before you get perseverance, which is going to be our best and saw amulet on. 
But for the first week of the season, it's not really available. And it's going to be way too expensive to realistically buy. So just any sort of amulet or maybe a eternal struggle with some decent implicits on it might be a good option, especially since that will give you holy strike, which should feel really nice. But later on, we do want to eventually get ourselves a impressence. Now, impressence is going to be an absolutely insane amulet. We want specifically the one that makes it so despair has no reservation if cast as an aura. This is going to allow you to actually turn on despair and enfeeble at the same time, which will make you substantially tankier as enfeeble is going to be an insane defensive layer, especially after it got buffed. And it also just has a lot of really nice stats on it. It has life, has damage over time, has chaos res, and it has a little bit of flat chaos. It's just an overall really good amulet. And the maddening presence on it, they get when you kill a rare unique enemy. So it's really nice because it basically makes a little circle around you that reduces the action speed of anything that gets near you. So it's even more defenses. And presence is just way too good not to use. Super, super, super late game. You can go for a new uber, uber elder in presence that is both despair has no reservation cost if cast as an aura and enfeeble. If you get one together, that means you get effectively 20% of your mana back. So you should be able to fit in a flesh and stone in here as well. And then have an absolutely tanky build that is basically going to never die. Next on for our other ring, you can just kind of get whatever you want on one of them. So this is another good place to get filler stats. And then we're going to want to find a death rush. Now death rush is just basically best in slot for this build. Nothing else really comes close to it. The adrenaline is going to be really nice since this is not going to really be a bosser. You can do some decent bossing with this. But this is mostly going to be a map clearing build. And because of that, the recovery life on kill is going to be a really nice defensive layer for keeping us alive. You can find whatever you want for that. But the only rule that matters in terms of which death rush you buy is the adrenaline. Don't get a one second on kill adrenaline. Try to find a two or three second adrenaline death rush as one second just doesn't really feel too good. And you're going to lose it between packs, giving you some really weird bursts of movement speed here and there. It's going to feel a little bit awkward. But adrenaline is going to give you physical damage reduction, which we heavily need in this build. And it's just going to give us a bunch of generic damage, which is great because generic damage is how we scale Death's Oath. Scaling this chest play is actually pretty difficult. And the adrenaline is actually a pretty nice way to scale it further, as well as giving you a little bit of movement speed so you clear faster. For our belts, we're going to want a Stygian. And eventually, we're going to want to craft the Stygian with Torment Essence for a chance of Void being shocked. Between this and a chance of Void being shocked jewel, we'll eventually be able to fit in a Storm Shroud to be ailment immune. And this means we drop Purity of Elements completely and then have no issues with either shocks or with any delirium that we do, or with chills. In terms of flasks, these are pretty simple and you can kind of get whatever you want here, but it's just the default package of flat armor, flat evasion, as well as percent armor, percent evasion, a quicksilver with some movement speed on it, and a sulfur flask that you can get whatever suffix you want on. I would honestly maybe say to get regen, the regen craft from someone else, as that will feel pretty nice, especially while you're mapping, just to make you feel a little bit more tankier and give you a little bit more recovery. Up next is going to be the gems that we want for this. So for gems, again, they're also pretty cookie cutter. You're going to need to get mana reservation efficiency on every single one of them to be able to have enough mana to actually fit everything in. And then for the rest of the stats, you can get whatever you want. I would like to put life on here. You can also look for damage over time, chaos damage, whatever other filler stats you want. Even if you need some attributes, you can put the attributes on here or some resistances if you're short on resistances. Just try to get reservation efficiency and then anything else that you please. The only cluster that we're going to need super early on to be able to fit all of our auras is going to be a sublime form cluster. Now, this can be a three passive. This can be a two passive. Whatever you find, just any evasion rating small cluster jewel with sublime form on it. You can also try to look for maybe life or resistance or any other useful stat on the smallie points. But we just need this for the grace reservation efficiency. And the fact that it also gives us 10% all res, it'll help us res cap a little bit easier. That's about it for the medium and the starter setup. This, in my opinion, is a really cheap path to building, especially since this build isn't too popular for some reason, even though it's a pretty solid mapper and farmer of basically all content. But this should overall cost you maybe around five to ten div to eventually get everything. The death rush and the impressions being the majority of the cost, especially early on. But overall, it's a pretty cheap path to building and it'll be very strong. Last thing I want to talk about is the end game setup. Now, this is simply just a showcase of what you could potentially go for in an end game setup. What we're going to be changing here mostly is going to be the cluster jewels. We're going to be more heavily focusing on them, as well as fitting in a timeless jewel for substantially more tankiness. If we want to look at the cluster jewels really quickly, what we're going for here are going to be Wicked Paul, Unwaveringly Evil, and Holy Grace. These are just simply the best possible setups for our clusters. 
Now, if this is too expensive, which they will be too expensive, I'm sorry. My other build and leak starter for this season is going to be one that uses the exact same cluster. But what you could do is instead look for maybe nine or 10 passive large passive jewels instead, or potentially just cheap out on one of the notables. You'll be just fine without it. And then you could upgrade to better ones later. As for the medium cluster jewels, they're pretty simple. We just want to find a way really evil since it's going to be the best possible scaler. We just want generic chaos damage since the majority of our clear is going to just be done through Death's Oath and not through Caustic Arrow. And generic chaos damage is the only real way to scale it, as well as full of light because it's generic damage over time, which also benefits it, as well as giving us recovery and life, which just makes us feel tankier. We're just going to want to fit in four of these as there's nothing else that we really need, as well as for the cluster jewel being the same twice over. So just feel free to cheap out if you need to. Lastly, the other thing that we're going to be changing in terms of our tree is going to be fitting in a glorious vanity. Now, specifically for this, what we want to find is one with Zibakwa as the name. The number doesn't really matter too much until you start min-maxing later, but Zibakwa is the only thing that is important because we're putting it here to turn the low life node pain attunement into divine flesh. What divine flesh does is it makes it so all damage passes ES, which is fine. We don't care about that anyway, since we're running Ildritch battery. So our energy shield isn't helping us for damage anyway. And it's going to make it so half the damage we take is taken as chaos damage instead, as well as giving us plus five to maximum chaos resistance. So what that means is if you're 76 all res and 83% chaos res, half the damage is going to be fought against 76 resistance and half of the damage is going to be fought against 83 chaos res. Not only that, but this gives you a lot of recovery because the higher the chaos res you get, the less damage Death Souls is going to do to you, so the more your regen is going to do, as well as basically making you immune to any chaos damage because at 83 chaos res, no chaos damage is going to really do much to you. The other thing you could do to min-max a little bit, and the easiest way to do this is to get number 250 Zabakwa. There are a few other combinations that will do the same thing, but all you want is a timeless shul that turns this node right here into Cult of Chaos. Not only does this give you chaos res, so it makes it easier to chaos res cap, but gives you plus one maximum chaos res, which is quite a lot of added EHP. It's a very, very strong node and any sort of maximum chaos res they can get is very, very powerful. You could try to find out any of these other nodes as well, but be a little bit less efficient since you have to use up more passive points to pick it up. So ideally in a super min max scenario, you get Cult of Chaos on this one. Let's talk about the gear differences that we will have from the mapping slash mid game path of building to the end game path of building. First thing is going to be a better bow. Now there is going to be a full guide on how to craft this bow in the other path of building. But this is basically what a perfect bow would look like for this build. And this is fully deterministic with the exception of one portion of it. But you could always sell your bricks to other builds. So getting this bow, you actually can make a little bit of profit at the same time. As for a quiver, it's going to be the same thing, just a little bit more min-max. You're probably going to want to try and get more of your resistances on here. As getting all of your resistances for this is going to be a little bit tough, especially considering all the items that we're using. What I might recommend in terms of resistances is to potentially get resistances on all of your cluster jewels as that is a really good place to also find any dexterity or strength that you might be missing to fill in everything. The biggest change to this path of building is going to be Viridi's Veil. Viridi's Veil is absolutely cracked. This is a just I do not want to die helmet that is just well insane. The nice thing about it is it has plus level of socketed gems. Now this is going to roll either plus one or plus two. Ideally find a plus two because this helmet is so underutilized. Everyone thinks this is garbage. So it's going to be like five chaos anyway. So you might as well get plus two. And the reason we want to do that is because if we get plus two, we then can put our auras inside of it and we can put an enlighten in here, which means we get a level five enlighten for free. Or if we want to splurge out a little bit more and get a level four, it will be level six, which means we can potentially fit even more auras in here. But the plus two is going to help with your mana problems in terms of fitting all of your auras in a lot uh, really nicely, as well as it having all res on it, which means you can get all of your resistances substantially easier. The nice thing about this and the reason we want to run this helmet is the special rolls at the bottom of it. Damage of enemies hitting you is unlucky while you have a magic ring equipped. You're hexproof if the magic ring is in the right slot. You take no extra damage from crits if it's in the left slot. So what we want to do here is we want to run a magic ring in our left slot. You do not want this in the right slot. Hexproof is kind of whatever. We don't really care about curses. We'd rather be immune to crits, which is a great defensive layer, as well as making enemies unlucky. What that means is whenever they attack us, they're going to have to roll twice. So let's say an enemy has a damage range of 100 to 1,000, right? Let's say it's lightning damage. And they hit us. And they rolled to hit 1,000 damage. Well, Viridis, they would re-roll that 1,000 damage. And let's say maybe they get 250. And because 250 is a lower roll, we're going to take the 250 instead of the 1,000. So effectively, Viridis Veil on that hit 
Midas takes 75% less damage. This is just incredible. And it just gives us everything we need. And it's just disgusting. In terms of the ring we want to use for this, ideally we want to use an Iolite ring because it has chaos damage as a base. But you can honestly use whatever base ring you want. If you can use a percent max life ring, you can use a chaos res ring, you can use a normal resistance ring. Use whatever ring you want. But all you really need to do on it is to alt spam it until you hit tier one life. You can also just try to buy a blue ring with tier one life on it if you'd like. And then for the suffixes, you can craft whatever you want since we have two rolls on here. I personally going for minimum frenzy charge since a pretty big damage increase. But you'd also go for resistances or any attributes I might be missing. Whatever you need to fill in the rest of your stats. Otherwise, the rest of gear is pretty much the same. We just want to look for a better Astygian. We want to look for a better Jewel, potentially get Corrupted Blood Immunity somewhere. And then we just have a really well-rounded build. Now, some other final things to mention that would absolutely take this build to the next level would be Mage Blood. Mage Blood would be amazing in this build. And it'd be a really nice endgame upgrade that would give you somewhere around 20 to 30% more damage because you'd have a permanent uptime on a Sulfur Flask, as well as it giving you just really insane defenses, which are already insane but with the increased effects that you can put on flask with enkindling orbs you should be able to hit somewhere around 40,000 evasion rating and about 40,000 armor and at that point i really don't know what else you could do for this build to make it tankier it's already going to be a massive massive giga tank the last final upgrade that this path of building does not have that could make this build super min max is potentially fitting in the new jewels from lab so what you could potentially do is pick up this basic jewel socket here and then drop two of your normal jewels and instead run three grand spectrums to get some nice stats from it. So what you could possibly go for here would be a minimum frenzy grand spectrum. This would give you three frenzy charges permanently and that means you could drop the frenzy charge roll on the blue ring. And then for the other two, what I would recommend is probably just a, a minimum endurance charge grand spectrum, which would mean you have permanent endurance charge uptime too. And then a max life grand spectrum, which should give you somewhere around 300 to 400 extra life. These are very, very expensive. And it's probably around maybe 40 to 50 div for everything you might need combined as you'd want to buy all three at the same time to really make it good. But it would be substantially better than basically any other jewel that you would get. Sure, there's a little bit of damage, but you'd get so much tankiness out of it. That'd be very much worth it as a super, super end game setup. And that's all we really have to say about Caustic Arrow. This build is my baby. I love this build. I had such a great time playing it. It was really fun to farm a Mage Blood on. It was really fun to basically farm anything in the game with it. It's really good at farming Deliriums. It's really good at farming speed maps. It's honestly even a really good Magic Find build. Some people play this build as a Magic Find. If you just... Simply remove some of the items, fit in a little bit of magic find. You can do really, really well as a low tier magic finder with this or a low juice magic finder. And then in terms of boss damage, it has pretty respectable boss damage with Vol Caustic Arrow kind of carrying most of your damage. And eventually, once you get Mage Blood, you can hit somewhere around 8 to 10 million boss DPS. This build is never going to be a bosser, so that's basically as, as, ba as much as you get. But honestly, it's still a pretty decent amount and you can honestly do Ubers with that, assuming you play pretty well and, you know, don't face ink absolutely everything. And as assuming you can accept killing the boss a little bit slower, it can very much be Uber viable if you want to take the build to that. If you have any questions, please feel free to leave them in the comments below. I'll be more than happy to answer any questions about you have about this build. I'll be happy to talk about it at any time. Or if you just want to come by my stream on Twitch, and ask me any questions there. I'm live every single day, and I'll be more than happy to answer any questions you have. Other than that, I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. If you play Caustic Arrow, I hope you enjoy your time, and I hope you enjoy the builds as much as I enjoyed putting it together. And I'll see you guys in the next video.